All right, hello and welcome to another uh, session of our Social Justice Speaker Series. My name is Molly Wirens. I'm Pastoral Associate at Christ Our Light. And I am joined here by our Social Concerns Development team. We have Bob and Carol Stage, Barb Greenwood, and Deanna Louie. Um, and we are sharing our second of our series right now. Um, October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And so we are uh, addressing that by talking with uh, a couple of people who work at Pearl Crisis Center in Malacca. And we will look forward to that conversation. But as we begin, um, we are going to begin in prayer. And so I invite Deanna Louie to share her prayer with us. Let us pray. Loving Savior, touch the hearts of those who abuse others. Heal their thinking so that they may turn to you and seek your ways. Help them to know that every human being is a treasure to you. Help them to know that you are a forgiving God and can lead them to a path to new life. And teaching God, we pray that you open our ears, our eyes, and our hearts to be more aware, outreaching, and supportive to people in abusive situations so that they won't feel alone and know that someone cares. Let us love them as you have loved us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. So we have uh, with us today uh, Judy Pearson and uh, Glenda Written hour. Is that how you say that, Linda? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So uh, Judy on the left has been uh, with Pearl Crisis Center for about 18, almost 19 years. And she uh, has lived in Malacca most of her life. She's married with a couple of sons as well as a granddaughter. Um, she has a passion for ending violence as her grandmother uh, was an abuse victim when there were no services uh, like there are now. Uh, in addition to caring about humans, she also has a passion for animals and their well-being as well. Oh, there it is. Oh, there's her paw shirt. <laughs> and Glenda um, is a, uh, a court advocate, actually, at, at Pearl Crisis Center. She's been there for seven years. Um, she lives in Ogilvy. She's married and has three boys. Uh, she has a passion for this work because her mother uh, was a victim of abuse. Uh, she loves music. Uh, she's super creative, and she also loves helping others. So welcome to both of you, and thanks once again for, for being with us. And we're going to invite them to share, and then we're going to um, offer some questions and have a conversation. So go right. ahead. Yeah. Well, thank you for having us on your Zoom meeting. This is wonderful. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about just Pearl as a whole, an umbrella, kind of what we all do. Um, and then Glenda is the expert in domestic violence advocacy, so she's just going to do a quick DV 101, kind of what it is, you know, why people stay, kind of just a general um, overview of that, and then certainly ask questions um, about that issue um, that you may have, and we could either diffuse some myths or educate on that whole issue, because often it's very misunderstood, and um, sometimes it gets too much victim blaming. So. Glenda's really good at that piece, and her and I usually do these trainings because we tag team each other. So um, if I can't say anything, Glenda is never a loss for words. So <laughs> that's what I love about her. I love her about her. So sometimes I'm like, I go blank. Um, so Pearl Crisis Center is located in Malacca, and we serve Malacca County. Um, and we've been here since 1996. And I've been here since 2002. And it doesn't mean we don't serve other victims from other counties, because a lot of times people will move into the county or don't want to work with their local agencies for whatever reason. Um, we help anybody who comes to the door, basically. Um, we work with the reservation, Black Span Reservation as well. Uh, they have a shelter up there. So we have a lot of partners, uh, partner with the shelters. We're not a shelter. Uh, we do house people in hotels. Uh, for safety and train hotel staffs to be like mini advocates um, and to watch out for them. So we, and those are our temporary stays until we can get them in a shelter. And just FYI, you now the shelters pretty much are full, they're packed. It's really hard to get somebody into a shelter long term and we don't have money to just have somebody in a hotel for months on it. So that gets really dicey. And 
oftentimes because of that, and if there's nobody for the victim to go to to stay with, a lot of times they go back. But Glenda can explain that more. Um, so we do lots of things here. Um, we have an office here. There's seven advocates, some very part-time, some are full-time. Um, we have an office here um, right in town. Uh, we also have a community closet thrift store, if you've heard of that, on Main Street, Malacca. Um, that's our store that we, um, back in the day, would get so many donations, and in our other building, we had no room. So I said, we need to make a thrift store. And so we created the name and opened the store on Main Street, and um, our thrift store does very well. We are just blessed with the donations the community gives us. And um, it's volunteer run with a little staff run. And um, we make about 30000 a year on the store. There's expenses with it, but we do generate an income. And it's also a great PR piece uh, for the community to know about us because when the advocates are down there, they tell everyone, you know, your money's going to help victims of domestic violence, sexual assault. Um, so it's really great PR, but it's also great for victims who don't want their abuser to know where they're going, they can zip into the store and he might be or she might be sitting in the car and they just think they're shopping, but they're really getting some information or getting help or meeting their advocate even there. Um, so it's more secretive. So it works out quite nicely for that. We also do um, Salvation Army through our office. I don't know if you're familiar with that program. Um, we don't get any funding to do it. We just agreed to help them out and be the administrator of it in Mille Lacs County. So that's for anyone. You don't have to be a victim. Anyone can come in with a problem and if they can cure the crisis, they can get some monetary help. So let's say your electric bill is gonna get shut off and you owe $300. Um, you just have to come in and bring the bill and Caitlin does that and um, helps you get caught up and then resolve the crisis. But a lot of times our victims um, use that service as well. So it's really nice that we can just do a one-stop shop and they don't have to go to all these other agencies. So um, we do that. We don't do bell ringing though. We have some of the churches here that help with bell ringing. So we don't do that piece of it. So it's kind of a partnership with the churches. Um, we provide the emergency say housing that I talked about. We do lots of referrals to other agencies. We're, we're called a, a, like a CAP agency, a community um, resource agency. The state kind of deems us that. So if we can't help them, we're going to find somebody in the community or somewhere that can help you. So we do lots of referrals with lots of agencies. We do um, go to court. Glenda can talk about that a little more. We help people get protective orders. Uh, help them fill it out. We go to court with them, um, sit there with them because that is a very scary time if you've never been in court. It's even scary when you've been in court. Still, it's going to court is not fun. <laughs> and especially if the abuser has lots of people on his side and you know the victim doesn't have. And I'm just using he and she. We do help males, uh, but our data says that it's more men who abuse than women. Doesn't mean you know, that's true, but that's what we see. So I'm just going to use it as a generalized statement. Um, but men, please know if you're being abused, we will help you as well. So I make that comment straight. So we get asked that a lot. Um, we're also involved in, um, we do sexual assault um, services here. So uh, we see those victims as well. We go to the hospital. The hospital will call us if they have a sexual assault victim there. And then we go to the hospital and um, meet with them and um, are there to just handhold, provide resources, whatever they need. Like we just are there to support with them and be their voice. And then with follow-up services, um, should it go to court and whatever they need. We're really like, we really do whatever we can, <laughs> whatever someone needs. We try to just do whatever they need and meet the victim where they're at. So um, we do lots of things. We're involved in the bullying program in the Malacca School District. Um, years ago, when I was on the school board, um, bullying was a huge issue. I think it still is. And uh, I found some money to incorporate the OBS bullying program in the Malacca School District. So we've been part of that for about seven years. Um, bullying has decreased um, from the program. They administer it wonderfully. And um, we like being part of that as well because bullying is just the next step to a lot of the times abusing when we get older. So um, I'm really proud of that program. We do um, jail support groups. We go into the jail 
and um, do women's support groups in there. And so many of the women that come to those groups are also victims. So they know when they do get out or, or needs assistance, they know where to find us. Um, we see a lot of um, victims getting arrested. And that's another complicated issue that Glenda might want to touch on why they're getting arrested. Um, so that makes it a little difficult. We provide financial assistance. Um, a lot of the churches around make us quilts. We have so many quilts, we give everybody quilts, which I, I you know, the one thing that we give out that I love the best is the quilt because I just believe and you can feel the love in the quilt of the other human being who made it and victims just wrap themselves in it and you can just feel the goodness that's coming from it. So love our quilts, love mm -hmm. our quilts. Um, we help, uh, we do a 40 hour uh, crisis line training um, to recruit volunteers to help us um, on our after hour calls and on the weekends because the staff can't do it all the time or they'll burn out. So we try to recruit volunteers and train them to take our phone calls and assist with that as well as the store. Um, so we do trainings whenever we can to anybody who wants to hear us like you guys. So, so appreciative of, of that. Um, Last time we did a church training, we had to stand in front of the whole congregation. <laughs> so this is like a little more at ease, but it's kind of, you know, uncomfortable to stay in front of the whole church congregation and tell our story. But um, so I appreciate you guys having us through Zoom. We also have a great team program. So one of our advocates here, uh, Tirza, she goes into the schools, Malacca, Onamia, and Princeton, and does the Safe Dates curriculum. And that's a nine session curriculum to teach children and students um, about healthy relationships and it covers just a wide range of information um, on that and so we've been doing that for well 12 years I think um, and from that we, we created a group called Tada it's teens against dating abuse and so we have I think 107 teens involved in that and they communicate through the remind program if any of you I guess teachers use Remind. It's through an app on your phone. So Tirza sends stuff out every day to the group, um, uplifting messages or just information about teen dating violence or awareness and prevention. So the kids get that those messages every single day. So um, that's part of our prevention work and working with youth. So we're not seeing these children years down the road <laughs> at our office. So. Glenn and I are both social workers, so we're all about prevention work. So um, we're proud of that program as well. And lastly, we um, about five years ago, I wrote a grant to get a um, domestic violence court in our county. I don't know if you read about it in the newspapers back then, but um, we've established through a group of about 70 some people, we um, got the funding, got the players in place, and we have a domestic violence court um in our county which there's not many of them and we're kind of a model program but i want to glenn to talk about that because she was the domestic violence court coordinator um now she's the advocate of it because the funding's gone so um that's all i can think of off the top of my head but i want glenda to talk about dv court and a little bit about anything i missed <laughs> okay um yeah like judy said we do a lot sometimes when we do these things it's like when we list it all off <laughs> it's hard to believe that uh, our little team here can accomplish so much um i appreciate you having us too thank you um i can talk a little bit about domestic violence 101 if you want me to go into that um so the main thing about domestic violence is that it's about power and control and that's at the center of it. And um, the person who is abusing um, their partner usually will use several different um, forms of abuse. A lot of victims that come in um, don't always have, you know, bruises or, you know, black eyes or things like that. A lot of times um, it's emotional abuse. Um, they maybe are told that they caused the abuse or that it's their fault or um, so a lot of times, a lot of victims come in and they, I've heard many say, you know, it's not that bad, you know, they're, they're not physically harming me, it's just this emotional abuse, which can be more difficult and challenging in court as well to 
um, present that um, to you know help them be safe. Um, a lot of tactics also would be like financial abuse. A lot of victims aren't allowed to work out of the home and earn their own money, or if they do, that it's um, used um, as a, like maybe they're given an allowance or um, they're not allowed to spend their money at all. Um, we've seen that a lot. Um, we've seen um, another tactic would be um, using the children. So even if they've left the relationship, they use the system, the child protection or, or the court system to um, try to use the children to um, get power and control back um, from the victim. And then um, also physical violence, obviously, that's a way that they can regain power and control um, and sexual assault. And then also we've heard and seen um, their religion used, victims who would seek out their church. It's very complicated um, where, you know, if their abuser is in church with them, they might not go to church because they're afraid. Or if after they've even broken up and not together anymore, um, who gets to go, right? Um, we've seen that happen before or using some of the biblical um, passages against victims. Um, as well, that's that's actually been pretty common, um, and so you know, there's many tactics that a lot of times it's minimizing, denying, and blaming, um, which we also have victims doing the same thing. So when we're um, supporting victims, a lot of times they'll say, you know, well, they only choked me a little bit. Um, well, I don't know how that could be, but th that just nobody wants to say that the partner, or the person that they love, is hurting them. It's a, it takes a lot of courage, and, and I say that to any victim that walks in the store, you know, I honor your story that you, I'm a stranger, and you can come in here and you can share your story, and there's so much shame um, wrapped around domestic violence and sexual assault, and it's very hard to pick up that phone or to walk into the store. Um, and also, to the family, you know, a lot of families, it's hard because they just want them to get out of the relationship, so you know, it's really hard on families as well to know how to support. Um, and the number one thing we always do is believe. And we, we believe anyone that comes in here. Um, it's not our job to decipher what's true or not, um, because I can't imagine what that would be like if you weren't believed. And a lot of victims aren't believed. They may have called the police before and maybe nothing happened, or they, you know, maybe they pressed charges and had to go to trial. Who knows, you know, what the outcome of the case was. Maybe they didn't do any jail time or anything. And many times, you know, victims don't want to split up their family. They just want the abuse to stop. Um, you know, they don't want to take their kids away. They don't want to do any of that. They just want to not be abused. And so it can be very challenging. There's a lot of reasons why victims stay. Um, you know, they can stay because they can't afford it. They can't, there's nowhere to go. Um, a lot of victims are isolated. So they've been isolated from their friends and family. And that's a slow process usually. Like, oh, you know, I'm uncomfortable around your friends or family, or they don't like me, or... Um, and then they're slowly pulled away. Um, and then, you know, that's again, part, part of the power and control. And then, you know, maybe they have kids and they don't have anyone to watch their kids so they can work or they don't have an employment history or they don't have enough, um, they don't have housing. Maybe they have five kids and they have no affordable housing. Um, a lot of the applications and supportive services in our community, which are wonderful, there's a lot of um, hoops they got to jump through and a lot of paperwork to fill out. Also safety, they might not be safe where they are now or have a safe place to be um, if there isn't an available shelter or, you know, they may not have a safe space to go until they do um, uh, leave the abusive situation. Um, also, maybe they have pets. A lot of victims we serve have not just cats and dogs, but maybe they have a horse or a farm. They have cows. They have bigger animals. And, you know, what are you going to do with that? Um, so there's so a lot of barriers for uh, victims in these situations. And so that's kind of where we come in and help um, offer as much supportive services as we can as they make those decisions. And a lot of times we've helped victims, you know, who want to leave and they, we do all the things that they are asking and we support them and then they go back and uh, many victims it takes seven to ten times 
And it's because of that, you know, they want the person to change. They're hopeful they're going to change or they're going to um, stop abusing. They're, they're sorry. You know, they, they want to be better too. Um, so that's just kind of the basic overall. I mean, that's like very <laughs> basic uh, of why, why victims stay and, and kind of what domestic violence looks like. Um, but it is at the root of it is power and control. So, and that's for sexual assault and domestic violence both. So that's why those tactics are used to then regain that power and control over that person. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about then DV court? So should talk about DV court, which there's hope for uh, people who do use abuse. Um, there's a program in our county through the court. So go ahead and talk about that a little bit. So um, a lot of times um, before the DV court was implemented, um, a lot of times um, there would be criminal charges of domestic violence, and then they'd be ordered to do certain programming or certain things, but the court system is so bogged down, they didn't have the capacity to really follow up and make ensure that there was accountability and follow through on those conditions. Um, so when the domestic violence court was implemented, it's really a wraparound program for both the victim and the offender. Because a lot of times, and in the data that we're seeing right now, even if they execute their sentence and let's say they just go to prison, um, a lot of them just reoffend as soon as they get released from prison. And that, those are the data numbers we're seeing even. Um, but this domestic violence court is an accountability court. It's a felony level court, so it's kind of the worst of the worst. And it's a very intensive program. The offenders um, that are screened in have to have a, a prior history of domestic violence felony and a new felony charge. So once they are screened in is what you call it, during their pretrial, um, they are surveilled by a team, uh, our surveillance officer through um, the sheriff's department and then the department of corrections. So they are monitored all the time randomly. They will show up at their house or work and do random testing. Um, they also are required to do programming, batters intervention programming, so they can unlearn the behavior because that is one of the, um, one of the uh, ways that they can um, stop abusing is by unlearning the behavior. And so um, they're just really monitored. They see the judge every week, uh, depending on the phase they're in. There's different phases. And so, and then the victims, you know, a lot of times they're, um, you know, want to be supported throughout that court process. Maybe they have to do a victim impact statement or maybe they have to testify. Um, so we offer supportive services um, for victims as well as legal support. So maybe they are trying to leave and they, you know, have custody issues or want divorce or whatever, then they have an attorney that is um, there to provide services for them on that. Um, it, there's a lot more to it, but that's kind of the, the basic overview. Um, but I, it's humbling for me as an advocate too. I, you know, followed some of these offenders from the time they're screened into even some that have graduated the program and even just the way that they look and their demeanor and um, the things that they say it, it's it's humbling to know that there is hope and that people can change if they want to and when they have the right supportive services and systems in place um, it makes it even more possible I mean, we've had some offenders who've graduated that have long histories of abusive behaviors like serious of uh, charges and convictions and since being in the dv court and graduating the program we haven't seen them. they're not in the system anymore so um and we've had a few hiccups you know some you know try their best and then end up back in it but um for the most part we're seeing some really promising things from our DV court so mm -hmm. the minute they violate i mean if they violate something when they're being checked they're off to jail Yep. Like it's really somebody is watching you 24 seven and if you screw up back to jail back to jail back to jail till you get it mm -hmm. <laughs> so and that was not happening before dv court so um i am a true believer in in it so yeah yeah oh. I mean, we could probably go on all day i'm sure <laughs> hey, well, i don't know if you have questions or yeah, in relation to the to the DV court, um, uh, now I'm going to forget my question. Um, 
what you talked about oh why isn't it more prevalent i mean you talked about how there are not many of them around is it mostly just funding or what's what's the story with that it's funding it's a big pot we got a half a million dollars to oh, implement it okay. um from the federal government and um it, it does cost a lot i think you i think the, there's better models coming out and maybe if you've got you've got to have your judge on board number one you must have a judge um, on board in charge saying we're going to do it and if you don't have the judge it's not going to work and then you have to have all the systems players underneath it for it to work so you could do it in an in internal system if everybody's on board within the system because they have to do the work anyway um, so you wouldn't probably need as much money, but if you want the like the legal aid assistance, that's going to be a funding issue. The advocacy agency does it anyway, so I wouldn't, you know, understand why they wouldn't be part of it. So, but it is a long process, and you have to make your procedures and your, you know, all your guidelines and and stuff like that. But there is funding out for it. You can apply for it each year; it comes out. So, um, and if your county like backs it, you know, you might yeah. be able to get your county like we did, like when the grant was gone, we kept our commissioners in the loop each year with how it was going. Um, because we weren't going to have funding for the probation officer or the deputy sheriff. So our commissioners believed in it because of our data and the county funds that now the county took it on as a oh, funding okay. for the county. Oh, so good. nobody has to find money anymore. So um so you have to have them on board as well and totally believing in the program so great okay hang on a second dan i'm gonna unmute you actually dan yep yeah. there can you hear me uh, in your in that well how many people do you probably something like the court how many people would you probably serve in a year as an agency or in the DV court in the court um, as far as the offenders go um, well a lot of them the phases can take over a year so depending on how long or how willing they are to do their programming um, so, you know, case dispositions can be over a year sometimes from when they're charged and arrested to when the case is finally dispositioned mm -hmm. or sentenced. But this program goes beyond sentencing, it's a part of probation. So we see probably, I think, I think right now there's 34 yeah, men in, in it. That was I the think, last number. Yeah, I but. think overall, I think since it started, I think we've had 150 some come through the program. But they'll only take up to 40 at a time because they can't possibly manage any more than that as far as checkups. Yeah, so it's hard to give like a solid number for a year just because yeah. they might come into, you know, still be in it for the next year, right? Okay. So it can mm -hmm. fluctuate, but yeah. And you started what year? In 2016. Mm -hmm. Wow, so. good. That really took off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What other questions do people have? I'm curious about your shelters. How many, you said you have more than one shelter and how many women, is it mostly women and family, women and children that you shelter? We don't have a shelter. We put them in a hotel. Oh, in a hotel, okay. And then we work, usually we work closely with like Cambridge has an actual shelter where they live or Anna Marie's in St. Cloud you might be familiar with. Um, or there's a shelter up in Wakan with the band. So we put them in a hotel for, you know, three to five days maybe, and then hoping a spot will open up where they can move into the actual shelter and live there till they can get back on their feet. And generally how long a time period is that? That they would stay at the shelter? Yeah, shelter right. Each shelter kind of has their own rules. It used to be like 30 to 60 days. Um, but right now I think it's a little longer just because of the situation we're in. Okay. Um, and they might make exceptions too for different people depending on the situation, but 30 to 60 days used to be like the norm. And, and what kind of donations are you looking for, um, in your, for your thrift shop? If, if this helps provide funding for these services? Well, we take clothing. Uh, small household items, linens, 
um, decor. We can't take anything big, no furniture, no beds, no nothing. Okay. We don't have any room for that. Unfortunately, we have a kind of a small space or no electronics, no TVs, no microwaves, anything like that. Okay. Um, women's clothing is, I think, our number one seller. Of course, men don't give up their clothing very easy or their stuff, <laughs> um, <laughs> including my own husband. Um, so <laughs> kids stuff, kids books, toys, clothes, mm -hmm. something like that. Okay. And we always need volunteers at the store. Too. Yes. So that's a big, even if, you know, items aren't able to be donated or stuff like that, just giving back time in that way, it's really helpful. Um, mm -hmm. It's a big job to, to do the store and to turn things over. Um, we have yeah. some really great volunteers, but we're really short right now. We can always use volunteers. <laughs> yes. And when is the thrift store open? Right now, um, it's open Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday from 10 to 5. Did she open it to 5? From I'm 4. Sure. 10 to 4 for sure. Normally it was Monday through Friday, but, um, okay. you know, this is what we normally do. But right now things are a little different. Right. Our office right now is open Monday through Wednesday as well. But we're on call working from home the other days. So, um, How about just in response to just what you're saying with, you know, limited hours because of the COVID situation we're in? How have you seen um, that play out with domestic violence calls? Have you seen an increase? Has it been kind of the same? What have you seen? Well, it was really down when we first got in in March. Mm -hmm. Everything just went silent. Um, except Which is for scary. You know, everybody just wasn't calling. And then gradually, um, it's been increasing again. And we do have an after hours. Um, after hours, our phone goes to the refuge and in Cambridge and then the advocates there are there anyway at the shelter and then they'll filter calls back to us so that's how we were able to work from home um, but since then we've all the staff has all gotten their own work phones so they can be calling victims from home um, and they can, victims can reach us through the Pearl email they can email I, I watch that so if a victim emails me I can pass it on to the appropriate advocate for follow-up with their phone so um yeah it was really kind of quiet but now it's starting to it's starting to pick up again so and i'm really worried about once the eviction Alter. thing is lifted oh, right mm -hmm. um i'm really worried that people are gonna be so behind in their rent mm -hmm. and um we just don't have the money to help i mean months maybe you know so that's where we need to pull in other resources like lakes and pines and, and other agencies that got a lot more funding to help with that issue but i'm really worried when that gets lifted right right it's gonna happen so yeah. we have seen a lot more um need for protective orders mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, i mean we're probably doing two to three a week sometimes more and this so that's is an increase from normal and this can be you know between mom and son mm -hmm. um grandma and the granddaughter um it doesn't mean it's just an intimate partner man and woman mm -hmm. we're seeing more family violence you know when i worked at when i first started here years ago never heard of beating mm -hmm. grandma and then as the time went on we started seeing these cases where beating grandma grandpa mm -hmm. and it's just gotten worse yeah mm -hmm. which is so disheartening yeah right what yeah. um you know, Judy, as you've been there for, you know, almost 19 years, what do you say, what do you see as having changed and what's kind of remained constant? Well, the power control has never changed. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah. it's, I don't care if you're drunk or high or whatever, if you've got it in you, you know, like to blame that, we might heighten the issue, but if you have power and control issues, it's going to play out in your life, no matter what you're using or not using. So that has never changed. Right. But like I said, the internal family violence, um, yeah. that has changed and maybe it was there, but now people have permission to come forward for help. Um, the pet abuse, that's yeah. always been there and I knew it, but now we're shining more light on it. If, if your partner's abusing your animal, he's more likely abusing the family. Um, and I'm very passionate about that. And so, and that's why a lot of women, you know, men, they don't leave. And I have horror stories that I don't want to share what they did to their kitty or puppy mm -hmm. in front of them, the children. So um, 
that is still there, but I'm glad there's more light shined on that issue. Yeah. Um, well, and I think that I know at Anna Marie's, they added a pet center, mm -hmm. right? A shelter. Yeah. And I don't know if they have one. Do they have one in Cambridge too or no? I think they have a kennel back there, uh, some place okay. for smaller pets. But like Glenda said, these bigger, your big, my, like when yeah. my horse was there, my yeah. horse, or my right. goat or whatever, you know? Yeah. They, um, so that's a hard one. Yep. And they won't leave. Some women will not leave without them animals. Yeah. They would right. rather be beat up than leave the animal. So, mm -hmm. so that's sad. That's yeah. sad. Um, can I just yeah, show that, I, oh go ahead. Can I just can I just show this website piece for a minute? Sure. And then do you want to share what, what this is about? So this is the this is the website, and so up on the top you know, you have your various menus. So if I went over to sexual assault information, if I've been sexually assaulted and I'm looking for this, and then all of a sudden I'm at my house and my partner, whoever is doing the abusing comes over to the computer, this button right here, I can hit quick escape and it takes me to Google. Huh. So that my partner sees that I'm just searching Google instead of looking for help. And I also went over here to history and it comes up as Google and not as Pearl Crisis Center. So I'm just like, wow, to me that is brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I love that. I just, I'm blown away by that. So, um, but really nice website. Yeah, lots of good stuff on here. Um, and I love this quote from Brene Brown too. Um, we I love Renee Brown. <laughs> I know, she's the best. I'm imperfect and vulnerable and sometimes afraid, but that does not change the truth that I am also brave and worthy of love and belonging. So, amen to that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, I think, uh, and I also, back to the question, um, like men, more men are coming forward. I mean, I've never seen a man ever, oh. you know, the first, you know, five, six years seven years uh, working here. And then we're starting to see more men. I mean, some men come in to get um, protection for their children, uh, for the children, because maybe mom is using or just violent and what's going on there. Um, but there have been more men stepping forward and, you and, know, just yeah. sharing their stories. So there's no shame in that. I think men think they got to be strong and it doesn't happen to them, but it does happen to them. Yeah. Yep. Women can be abusive too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So that whole myth, I think back in the day, I mean, women advocates never believed a woman could ever be abusive. I mean, that was like the theory, but um, no, I don't agree with that anymore. So, yep. and how long does, I'm just not as familiar with order of protection. Does that last a certain amount of time? When does it get lifted? How does that work? So typically, um, if a victim would like to seek an order for protection, it's really difficult to get the children on there. Um, a lot of times, unless they're, they're actually being physically harmed, um, which I've noticed has put victims at a safety risk more because they're trying to protect their kids and themselves and can't. Um, but typically from when they, it depends on the judge or most orders are about two years. Um, but the victims have the right to modify that at any time. Um, but that it, it's a, it's a very scary process because if they, do the protective order and then it gets granted by the judge there's like a it's like a temporary one until either the person they filed it against argues about it or does, says they don't want it so they actually go to court and many victims are very scared um and so they and then they have to go and face that person in court and um we've seen it where we're the only ones with a victim and they have and then the respondent has a whole brigade of people um there to support them or an attorney and the victim has no attorney we're not attorneys um we help support them and we help them with the order but they we're not attorneys <laughs> so um it, it's it can be very intimidating and i've seen victims who pull out right at the at the court hearing and they're like forget it and and leave and don't want to get it because it's too scary but they can keep extending it. You can extend mm -hmm. it before it expires. Yep. You can ask the judge to grant it another year or two. You can get a lifetime yep. OFP. We've seen them. Yep. 
if it's that severe, like you can get a lifetime OFP. So, and you can put your pets on the OFP. Thanks to Gail Kulik, Judge Kulik, back when she was uh, on the, in the legislature, um, she got pets put on the OFP. Oh, wow. So your pet can be protected as well. Yay. So, yay. Wow, <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, so. Hmm. Yep. Any other and questions? I think, I think that um, Minnesota is actually quite a leader in this field, aren't they? Yes. Yes, mm -hmm. yes we are. I thought. Yep. yep. Seems like there's some very strong shelters and crisis centers and advocate support around. Um, so we're so grateful for that. Gal, wow. Mm -hmm. That's really good. I know what, it can be really challenging. I think um, one of the biggest barriers I, I see right now is housing. There's not yeah. a lot of affordable housing. Yeah. So even if we have the ability to um, help support and get them into a place of their own, um, because a lot of times once victims get into their own space and they realize, wow, I can do this without this abuse, um, it's very empowering for them, but it's really a challenge to get them to that place right. um, because of the lack of housing around. There's, it's, it takes a long time to even just get on a waiting list or to get in. <laughs> And then we've also had victims who have disabilities or small children or have to work. They can't physically move that, all their stuff. Um, you know, they're all by themselves and with little children or, or other circumstances and they can't physically move all their stuff. They've been isolated from their family and friends or their family and friends live in another state or county far away. They have no one to help. So we've had a couple churches that have stepped in and helped us. Um, the congregation has come together and helped a couple victims move and both of which are still free from their abuse and on their own. So, hey, yeah, great. so yes. it, it takes, it takes a whole it takes community everyone. to help us. <laughs> yeah, it takes a community and that's really what I've seen. Even yeah. with the DV court yeah. and everything, we cannot do that without everyone on board and, and supporting what we do. So. Right. Do, uh, uh, do victims often move with their, with children often move to where they have relatives like move out of state or move across the state or something like that so that they're away from the abuser? Um, yeah, sometimes, uh, sometimes the one of the barriers to that would be if they're married and there's a custody issue. Yes. Uh, you can't just take your kids across state lines. Yeah. You know, right. so there is just, there's so many more barriers for victims to leave than there is for them to stay. And that's what we, that's what we're here for. How can we help alleviate a lot of those barriers so that if they do want to, and they do choose to, that we can support them in that. And they have, we don't want to set them up to fail. You yeah, know? right. Yep. Mm -hmm. So if you could wave your magic wand and get anything that you needed to help you out your cause, what would you want? What would you want? More money and more volunteers. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And affordable housing. To be honest, I mean, it costs like close to $100 a night in a hotel. Right. You right. know, and sometimes they got to stay there maybe even a week. $100. Yeah. Yep. Um, and we just get a little money from the state for emergency purposes. And that can be used up way yeah. before the grant's done. You know, so or a private attorney for all victims in yeah. house. Yeah, in house attorney, yeah. in house a mental nice. health worker, a yeah. psychiatrist or psychologist, or a therapist, a uh, <laughs> lawyer combined. In one. <laughs> yes, and exactly. It's a magic wand, so yeah, that is, <laughs> it could do that. that. You know, that yeah. is a huge uh, one for a lot of victims. Just understanding and navigating the legal system in general, and right. you know, as advocates, we can kind of guide, but. We're not attorneys. I wish I had a button, not a lawyer. I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, anything yeah. else from anybody? Oh. <laughs> it's been super enlightening. So thank you um, so much. And thanks for your work. I mean, it's such important work. And I'm glad that we're neighbors and working on that. Um, and I hope we can find some ways to do some collaborating or supporting of your work. Because, um, yeah, it's, and it's, going to be here for a long time unfortunately so yeah we are going to make our way and try to chip away at it but um like you said it takes a whole village and a lot of community members so um hopefully we can widen that circle a bit 
So well, thank you. Yeah, thank you so thank much. Thank you for having yeah. me. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. And hang on just for one minute. And also I'm gonna let our audience know that uh, we also have a session on youth and homelessness that we did uh, last month. And that was with uh, Open Doors for Youth in Elk River. And so that is actually on our uh, Christ Our Light website. And then stay tuned for November 19th, uh, 7 to 8.30 p.m. We're going to be doing a session on uh, awareness and prevention of suicide. Uh, and that'll be um, another Zoom uh, conference. And we'll be sending that information out. And if you want a link to that, please let us know. Because um, we'd love to have you in on these, uh, these sessions. So... Thank you so much, and uh, we look forward to uh, continuing good discussions on really good work. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.